Thanks for your patience with our technical issues. And, and seriously, if you can't see with me in your way, you might want to move so you can, because there are going to be slides that are somewhat relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, and thank you, Joe, for inviting me. It was a good and easy trip up. We made it in uh, less than an hour from Philadelphia, which actually, he wasn't even driving fast. I, I was there. I don't know. It's not an issue at all. But uh, what I want you to know is that if you care about separation of church and state, if you care about the acceptance and inclusion of non-theistic Americans in our society, then you're my boss, and I work for you in Washington, D.C. So I was in politics in Maine. Now I live in D.C. lobbying on, on your behalf. And we've had a great time lately. I don't know how many of you get, well, how many of you get our action alerts or emails? Raise your hands if you do. Okay, so maybe 25%. Well, we just held a summit in Washington, D.C. about uh, our secular decade plan, which I'm going to be describing to you. It was a really exciting time because we're really talking about future leaders uh, for our movement. In fact, something that I've heard a lot when I've traveled around the country, I've only had this job less than two years, is that uh, we need more diversity. We have great people with experience. We need to involve more young professionals in the movement, need to be more inclusive of women in the movement. At our summit, uh, half the attendees were women, more than half of the people who chaired the committees that worked on substantive public policies uh, were women. We are trying to look toward a uh, more diverse face, if you will, for the organization. I was an inspired, if you will, to do this because I met someone who was a test pilot uh, down in Texas when I was giving a speech not too long ago. Uh, her, her name is Jen, and her partner's name is Jenny, which can be confusing, Jen and Jenny. And their little boy, Alex, that they raise uh, down there in Texas, this is Jen Peoples. And it was meeting her down in Austin, Texas, where I said, for our summit, we want to bring together people who can bring new ideas and fresh ideas for kind of the next couple generations of leadership. And that's what our summit really uh, tried uh, to accomplish uh, on behalf of, of secular Americans. And... I uh, certainly uh, feel like I have a lot to learn in this job as a new person with the Secular Coalition for America. And first thing, of course, I did when I got this job is I went to the Creation Museum in Kentucky, and I learned a whole lot there because I learned how the dinosaurs got on the ark because they were baby dinosaurs. And it says so on a plaque at the Creation Museum so you know it's true. You're all set there. And you also learn a lot just because I come from Bangor, Maine, a little small town. That's what I represented in, in the Maine legislature. So Stephen King was one of my constituents. And some people think Stephen King is kind of scary because he writes about demons. But then I went down to Louisiana where they have Governor Jindal who specifically said he believes in the existence of demons. <laughs> now, which do you think is more scary? I mean, I'll, I'll take uh, Stephen King any day. And of course, they have down uh, their Senator Vitter. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Senator Vitter. He's the one who will lecture you about your sex life while he's having sex with prostitutes around the corner from my office in Washington, D.C. Which, hey, I'm a libertarian about these sorts of things, but the uh, hypocrisy level of that seems to get under my skin uh, a little bit. And, and it was also Senator Vitter who said that opposing gay marriage was so critically important that it would be as bad as if Katrina and Rita were getting together. I'm thinking, Senator from Louisiana, isn't that you know, kind of important in Louisiana when it comes to hurricanes? And I thought Katrina and Rita getting together, two females, he should be more upset about that. <laughs> you know, very concerned. And so when I take on a job on your behalf in Washington, D.C., I'm taking on a, a tough job. I mean, we're talking about 535 people who make decisions for 300 million Americans. And uh, Senator Vitter is one of those 535. Another is Representative John Shimkus from Illinois. How many have heard of Representative Shimkus? Well, he's incredibly powerful. He's one of the 535 people who make decisions for 300 million Americans. And he said, uh, on the record, in a hearing of the United States House of Representatives, that you didn't need to worry about that global warming. Because in the Bible, it says that there's one flood, Noah's flood, that's it. No need to worry about rising seas. You're all set there. Thank you, Representative Shimkus. And you might laugh and say, oh, he's just a member of Congress. Except that that's one of 535 people who make decisions for 300 million Americans. And since last November, Representative Shimkus isn't a backbencher anymore. He's the chair of a committee. 
He has power in our society. And of course, some of you may have heard of a former U.S. representative, now a U.S. senator, named Toomey. Some of you may have heard of him. And now this gentleman, he's the one who said that doctors, he has supported a policy where doctors would be jailed for exercising uh, a woman's right to choose, for allowing them to exercise their right to choose. He specifically said that he would want to prohibit gay people from adopting children. Speaking as a former assistant attorney general who handled child protection and handled adoption cases, I can tell you there are so many kids out there that need homes that that's a pretty remarkable position for someone to take, but it's one that your senator does take. And if you don't know him, another uh, member of the U.S. House from Pennsylvania is Joe Pitts. How many know Joe Pitts? He's from Pennsylvania. Joe Pitts, read about him in Jeff Charlotte's book, The Family. He's prominent in the so-called C Street group, and he's been very effective. For example, when there was a dramatic decrease in HIV in Uganda during the 1990s when the United States government through our foreign aid programs were distributing condoms and providing accurate scientific sex education, HIV was headed down dramatically in Uganda. Joe Pitts didn't like that. He worked very hard and successfully to limit condom distribution in Uganda and HIV rates heading right back up in Uganda. So Representative Pitts from Pennsylvania, extremely effective on behalf of the religious right. So when I say I take on a tough job on your behalf, I take on a tough job on your behalf in Washington, D.C. So, you know, give me some sympathy here. But what I am saying about the Secular Coalition for America is that we need to think and talk about where we're at. Anybody know who this is? Come on, if somebody goes to Trivia Nights. Very good, Margaret Mead. Because Margaret Mead, we always hear her quote, don't we? We hear that quote from Margaret Mead that's so inspiring, especially with me, you know, or you, know, you see it on the walls of nonprofits and on people's Facebook page, that famous quote that says, never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And it's a very inspiring quote. And I want to pay tribute to the people who I think have really lived that quote most effectively. I'm speaking, of course, of the religious right. Yeah. yeah, they're the ones who did it. Yes, they were. And those folks in the religious right, they looked around America back in the 60s. They saw what Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy and others were saying, and they didn't like that. And so they organized. They ran people for the school board, for the legislature, for the city council, and they built themselves up into a major force in American life until politicians who previously had not paid much attention to them started to pay a lot of attention. In fact, just after Ronald Reagan secured the Republican nomination for president in 1980, he gave a speech, August 22, 1980, to a huge hall of fundamentalist ministers gathered in Dallas, Texas. And you've heard the story about Ronald Reagan saying, tear down that wall. Well, President Reagan sure did seek to tear down that wall, all right. It was the wall of separation between church and state. That was the wall that he sought to tear down. And he was aware of the law that says you're not, as a minister, supposed to endorse candidates from the pulpit. And so, on August 22, 1980, he made this statement with all the folks, Jerry Falwell and the fundamentalist ministers assembled in the hall, in which Reagan said, quote, I know you can endorse me, but I want you to know that I can endorse you. And that was a turning point in American history. And congratulations. You got to tip your hat. Congratulations to the so-called moral majority. Why? Because I don't think they ever were moral, but they definitely were never the majority. They weren't the majority then. They aren't the majority now. And yet, they now have veto power over one of two major political parties in the United States. It is unprecedented in American history. We are closer to a theocratic government than we have ever been at any time in the history of this republic. But we at Secular Coalition for America, we have a modest plan to take over the United States. Are you with me? Are you going to help me out? Here's what we're going to do. It's called Our Secular Decade. It is a business plan. And it is a mainstream plan. Our values, see them here? Jimmy Stewart. I love this movie. These are Jimmy Stewart values. These are flag and country values. Our values are the values of Jefferson and Madison. Whatever you say about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, 
radical isn't the right word for them, but Gates values, Buffett values, those are our values. Our values are mainstream values. And sometimes it's part of our own mindset. We shouldn't fall into that trap of marginalizing our values because our values are the values of Tom Edison, the values of Walt Whitman. This is our heritage, and it is a proud heritage. And with the Secular Decade Plan, we are going to reinvigorate that heritage in this country. And how are we going to do this? Well, we are going to increase advocacy on public policy. Issues are going to be the driver of our success. And not just issues, but stories. We're going to tell stories about issues and lead to successful advocacy. Because it's not about statistics and statutes. Those are important, but it's about something else. This guy right here, 256 words. Those were 256 words at Gettysburg. Now, unless you believe that four score and seven years ago is a statistic, he didn't go into statistics. He didn't go into details about statutes. He told a story about the American people that in 256 words transformed how we feel about ourselves. This man right here, he told a story about getting us to the moon. It wasn't statistics. It wasn't statutes. He told the story of some boys going across the countryside. And when they came to an orchard wall in Ireland that was too high and too difficult for them to climb, and they thought that it would not permit their voyage to continue, they took off their caps and they tossed them over the wall. And then they had no choice but to follow them. That was what Kennedy told us. He told us we were going to get there within a decade. We had no idea how we were going to do it, but we knew we were going to do it, and we were going to accomplish it together. Now, as Gerald Ford said, I'm no Lincoln. Man, as Benson said to Quayle, I'm no Jack Kennedy. But for nearly two years now, I've been listening. I've been listening to this movement. And I've been listening to this country and listening to the mood about this country. And from that listening, I submit to you that our central public policy strategy is to tell stories of how our fellow citizens, real people, are harmed by the privileging of religion in law. Secular Americans, we labor under a noble flaw. We are so tied to our heads sometimes that we fail to connect with the hearts of our fellow Americans. We need to persuade a broader public so that the secular movement can grow and fulfill our patriotic mission. You see, secular Americans have, to date, been known for things like opposing In God We Trust on coins. Let us now be known for protecting children from the so-called faith healers who torture children while praising their own religiosity as they leave their children to die. Secular Americans have been known for opposing a manger in a town square at Christmas time. Now we must also be known for stopping fundamentalists from denying condoms and scientific education to poverty people in Uganda and other vulnerable people throughout the world. Secular Americans have been known for opposing the unconstitutional National Day of Prayer. But now we must also be known for opposing the theocratic legal concept that religious schools, because they are religious schools, have more leeway to punish children physically than non-religious schools. Secular Americans have been known for opposing under God in the pledge. Now we must be known for opposing the big con job pulled by mega ministers who live in palaces subsidized by your tax dollars with the so-called parsonage exemption in the IRS code. In the past, secular Americans have been opposed to a cross on public land on a hill. Now we must be known for opposing textbooks that tell lies to our children with tax dollars. Secular Americans have been banging that drum of symbolism for decades, and we just don't have enough to show for it. Secular Americans are a sleeping giant, a huge demographic, but we have yet to truly organize ourselves, much less galvanize the general population that's out there waiting to hear our call. The suffering of our fellow human beings at the hands of religious privilege in law has been overshadowed as we spend our time shaking